Welcome back to another exciting episode of Launching Logistics, the podcast where we explore the ever-changing world of logistics and supply chain management. I'm your host, Jim Becker, and today we're in for a real treat. Joining us is Ryan Schreiber, a longtime friend and industry veteran whose journey from logistics to technology officer offers us a great perspective on navigating the challenges we face in this space. You know logistics is one of those industries that never sits still. It's always moving, always changing, and staying on top of these changes is critical if you want to really thrive. But here's the kicker. How many of us actually take time to examine our business strategies, ask ourselves the tough questions, and look for ways to adapt and grow? Ryan's story is all about that constant evolution, whether it is adapting to new technology or simply shifting the mindset. And that's what we're diving into today. We're not just talking about the mechanics of logistics. We're exploring how the right mindset can really push your business forward, help you adapt to a volatile market, and allow you to lead with innovation. In today's episode, we'll hear how Ryan's approach to growth has really evolved from his early days in logistics sales to the current role in the tech space. We'll explore how mindset really plays a critical role in problem solving, both in your personal and in your professional life. You'll also get a chance to see the insights into how Ryan applies technology to help companies streamline operations and increase profitability, even when resources are somewhat tight. There are tons of valuable takeaways here. No matter where you are in your logistics career or what challenges you might be facing, So whether you're looking to scale your business, improve efficiencies, or just get some fresh perspectives on how to navigate the current landscape, this episode is for you. Make sure to stick around until the end. Trust me, there's plenty of gold in this conversation. Now, without further ado, let's dive into this great conversation with Ryan Schreiber. Yeah, I mean, you've not you you and I've known each other for quite some time, and I remember the first time we met. Do you remember the first time we met? What when was the first time we met? It was at a TIA conference. It was in Orlando. I don't remember what year it was, but it must have been like 2013. And you know, DAT had that um, had like you know at the at the Hard Rock one there the at the big Orlando party, the 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 most expensive party I've ever gone to in my life. We stood out there for probably like it was you, me. And then one of your guys, I, whose name I don't remember. John was the guy that was with me. That's right. And um, and we just hung out there for like two or three hours. I think was with you. I no, think. it was just me. It was just me back it then. It was just you? Yeah, it was just me. Okay, there was, another, there was another owner out there too. It was a great night. It was a really good night. Yeah, it was a really good night. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. That was the first time we met. And I just, yeah, I mean, ever since then, I mean, I just, uh, you know, that's that was whatever, nine or not, at least nine, 10 years ago. Like, yeah. You yeah, were still, I mean, least. you were, you guys were pretty, you were still pretty small back then. I mean, you certainly haven't had, hadn't had the success that you've had since then. I mean, which is incredible. You know, you've had the incredible growth and you've done an incredible job with that business. So it's been cool to like watch it from the outside, you know, and. Well, thanks. Yeah. And to make it, make it through, you know, the deflationary marketplace that we've gone through, you know, um, it's been trying on all of us, you know, I, I'd love to say, yeah, I had no problems. <laughs> yeah. Had problems. Um, and we all have problems. And who were who were you with back then? Um, I had uh, that was Spartan Logistics that I was uh, at the time. I was doing Spartan Logistics back then, so that was um, the Flood Brothers. And that's how I, I was definitely by myself. Yeah, the Flood Brothers. Yep, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've had I've had my great conversations with him as well. It was definitely a great learning experience. You know what's funny is his approach to like giving feedback was really bad. Uh, for me personally, in terms of like how I react to communication. But subsequently, like in the year since I've left, I've reflected on some of the feedback that he really had for me as a as a leader and as a business, as as somebody running the business and and owning the business. He was right about a lot of stuff. He just 
like, and I've never told him that. And I've always, always thought about like, but you know, like it was how, it, even if he had approached me better, I wouldn't have been ready to hear it. It's funny. You said the, the fixed mindset thing. Like I've had to train myself to have a growth mindset and cause I did not naturally have that or don't naturally have that. And, and I've reflected on that. It's like, Dave, Dave could have given me that feedback better about how to make some of the choices that I made for the business, but I wasn't ready to hear it. I had a fixed mindset and I really wasn't ready to hear it. So they've been, uh, yeah, it was an interesting time in my life for sure. But that was, um, that was Spartan Logistics that I was with then. Yeah. But then you've subsequently probably met Parker, the, the, the co-founder that I was with at the time that you were probably thinking of as Parker, who I was with, with, uh, we did Freight AI together after that. Right. Exactly. So, but we're on such a great topic that I really want to talk about it is the fixed mindset. Yeah. There's several different ways you can look at it. And sometimes you just get into a situation where fear when you're going, that all you can think about, let's just use a car analogy. You're driving along and you slam on the brakes and you're sliding, right? Either because you're going too fast, you're on rain, you're on ice, you're sliding. Our minds are the same way that we get this fixed way of being that that's all that we see at the present moment, and then we crash. And a lot of people in business have a fixed way of being or a fixed mindset. And, and then we realize, oh, I could have pumped the brakes. I could have let go of the brakes. I could have steered the wheel another direction. I could have... Slow down. I could have just slowed down. I could have slowed down. I've started to have more success in my career, Jim. Like once I learn to admit that like I don't know things because there's no better way to build trust than being like, I don't know. I'm going to go find out like, or I'll do, I'll put an effort to it. But like, I think that most of the relationships I have in this industry are the strongest, be, not because they want to talk to me. You know, most people think being a consultant is telling people what you know, like, oh yeah, nobody wants to talk to me because of what I've done in the 15 years of my career before they talked to like, right. They trust that I'm going to tell if I say something with authority, that it comes from a place of like, it's well-researched, it's well thought out. It's not because of me. It's because of, you know, aggregating feedback from other folks. And then if I say that I don't, and then they know that if I say that I know this thing, or I have this observation that I, because I was willing to tell them what I didn't know, I was willing to tell them, Hey, I don't know, but I'll go ask other people. Like that's created a, any success that I've really had is, is that change of, of mindset to saying like, I don't know anything. Like, let me go. And, and by the way, like, even if I know something that that thing that I know could be different tomorrow. So I need to constantly be reviewing, like, is that still true? Is that still the way that it is? You know, I think it's important. Oh, it's so important. And really, I mean, you and I connect several times a year all over the globe, right? So we're, we meet somewhere. We're always in the same circles because we're very similar individuals doing the same thing, right? We go to the same barber. Yes, it's definitely the same barber. I, I don't have a beard like you. And if I did grow it out, it would be a little red, right? So as, as we travel around in the same communities, what I find is all of us are very like-minded. And as I talk to other people, I'm, it seems like sometimes I'm talking to myself. And what, what you bring up is so important because I'd go one step further and really just allowing ourselves to be vulnerable, to really show that side that most people are protecting, that, that side that could be wrong, the side that doesn't have all the right answers, the side that, you know what, I, I get things wrong each and every day, Ryan, and I mess up. And I see things that I could be doing so much better. I have team members who like ask me why I don't get nervous doing interviews like this, you know, especially like if I do something on, you know, that is live, like freight waves or whatever. And I say it's because like I'm willing to be wrong. Like, like I don't, I don't think being wrong is bad. I'm willing to be wrong. And, and then I can say, like, hey, I was wrong about that, but like here's where I was coming from, or here's why I had that, here's what changed, or what have you. Like, and I think the willingness to be wrong is the only like if you if you don't have that you're not you, that is what stagnates growth and that's what stagnates business growth right like it's it stagnates personal growth but as it relates to like you know the are the industry that we're in the business that we're in right we've both 
we are both freight brokers and, or, you know, I'm not currently a freight broker, but I, you know, in my heart, I'm still a freight broker and you have to be willing to be wrong, which might mean taking a shipment from a customer and, um, you know, that's maybe a little bit outside your comfort zone and then finding a way to deliver for them. It might mean changing a, taking a new business strategy and changing the way you're going to market or, or trying something else. And you don't have to bet everything on, like, I'm not going to go on freight waves or I'm not going to come on your podcast or I'm not, and say, I bet my life that X, Y, or Z, you know, I, I'm not going to, I don't have to go that far in the same thing in a business context. I don't have to bet my whole business on capacity as a service being the future of freight brokerage, but you know, you have to try something and potentially be wrong and then know how to as long as you can unring the bell don't do anything you can't undo until you try it out being willing to be wrong also means like but you have to go in far enough to actually be wrong in a business context right like you actually have to try something enough to 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 know that it was actually wrong and not sandbagging like people are often from our perspective you know like what i see a lot at metaphora when working with you know businesses is uh, or freight brokers as a consultant, um, they don't, they're not willing to make sort of incremental changes around their business to see if a business strategy will work, right? So they're like, oh, we'll try this out, but like to actually make this work, we'd have to change everyone's compensation. So, like, I'm not willing to do that, but I'm willing to, tr- like, so you didn't actually try, you weren't actually willing to be wrong because you weren't willing to do the other stuff to make this thing successful. Uh, that matters for growth. I mean, otherwise you're going to stagnate and that's what makes these businesses stagnate. It's just true. Absolutely. And in our personal lives, we could take our personal lives on things that we're conflated with on a daily basis, things that we go to the line, but we're not willing to step over, but yet we'll judge, we'll point the finger. Yeah. How many fingers are pointing back at you? And I've learned to not do that because really, who am I to judge? And when was I last in their position? Maybe, I don't know, five minutes ago, my last meeting. And as we're growing, you know, I live each day in its entirety as just today. And tomorrow will be today also. That I will say is fact. Tomorrow will never come. Tomorrow will be today. And I don't go to yesterday unless we're doing some reminiscing and go, yeah, I remember that. And then I get out. And then I don't really go to the future too much until unless I'm doing a budget or a forecast. And then I'm saying, all right, we're on this journey. It's not the destination. It's the journey that matters. I, you know, I had a Papa shot in my office at Spartan Logistics. You know, you know what Papa shot is, right? The little basketball game. So I would play this and I, I, you know, I would like, I'd beat a bunch of people in. And there was this one guy that we had and he would always, I remember one time he's like, you know, Ryan, the problem is like, I, um, he's like, you know, you don't miss a lot of shots in a row. He's like, like my problem is like, I miss a bunch of shots in a row. And I'm like, here's the difference between you and me. I was like, here's the difference. I miss a shot. And it's not about the last shot. It's about the next shot. So I only think about the last shot in thinking about what do I need to adjust slightly to make the next one. And so even if I miss the next one, I'm just thinking about how do I apply that learning to the next shot? You miss one and you're nervous that you're going to miss the next one. And then you miss that one. And now it's a self-fulfilling prophecy and you're missing more. And so I think that what you're describing is is very much in that vein of like, I want to learn. I've said a bunch of times before on every, I probably said this on every podcast I've ever been on. The only way I know anything is because I've just made a bunch of mistakes. And I've made those mistakes over and over sometimes, unfortunately, like I'm a slow learner, but like I was willing to make the mistake in the first place, which was important. And then I've learned, from, I've, I've had to learn from it. And that's the only way to grow. And so if you don't reflect on it, if you, if you look to blame somebody else and point fingers elsewhere, like that's where you're going, you're never going to learn from those things. And that's true on a personal level. Again, it's also true in a business context. Like you, okay, I tried a business strategy. Like I, you know, I'm not sure what your operating model is, buy, sell versus cradle to grave, but I think you're buy, sell. But I've certainly had folks you know, in our business context, be like, well, we, you know, regionalization and buy, sell won't work for us. You know, 
hundreds of, of millions of dollar brokerages. Well, you can do whatever business strategy you want, but if it doesn't work for you, it's not because the sh- business strategy doesn't work. It's that it doesn't work in this context. It's worth thinking about, even if you don't want to do it, it's worth thinking about why it didn't work for you and what you can learn from it not working from you to apply to the rest of your business. I, I think that's, I think it's a good observation, Jim. Right. And I think from a consultant standpoint, maybe it is the context in which that they're working from that is why the business plan isn't working for them. Yeah. 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 And, but you've got to like, but you're right. I mean, you've got to, you have to build toward a short memory, right? You're describing kind of like in that quarterback context, use the sports analogy, right? Like the best quarterbacks throw, throw an interception. They go back to the sideline. They, they watch the iPad. They see what they did wrong. They go out and get behind center the next time and they're ready to sling it again. So you have to have a short memory to that point and be willing to go back out there and do it again and live today as today. Not with the baggage of yesterday, with the knowledge of yesterday, with the learnings from yesterday, but not with the baggage of yesterday. I think that's really, really important to your point. Yeah. And it's so true. You know, when when you have that Papa shot, and I've used that so many times, you know, I had a great mentor back in 1991 when I first started in logistics working with paper ponies on LTL, you know, um, Ron Williamson taught me that success is 99% failure and the faintest ink is better than the best memory. Two great quotes I still use today. He also gave me a third one, which is, um, it's amazing how much we learn from those who apparently have nothing to teach, right? And sometimes that person that's teaching me is my I, who I am, right? And when you look at that, when I take those Papa shots, statistically, I'm calibrating myself on what it does take to be successful, right? That probability, I'm building a probability, a statistical analysis, if you will, on myself on where's the pressure in my right arm? Where's the pressure on this? What's the arc of my angle? All of this information is coming in, just like in golf or football or basketball, whatever game I'm playing, business, or even in a conversation, I'm constantly listening. And really, when, when you have something so unique, like we're having a great conversation, I can look at what we're doing. I can also look at the knowledge that we have, the knowledge base, but who are we being? See, you're being your authentic self and I'm being my authentic self. The same as if you saw us at a convention or if we just ran into each other at a customer site where you were an intermediary for that customer on the technology side and maybe I was the transportation provider and or consultant we're all now talking like, oh, we're going to have fun now. That's what I've actually always loved about this industry, by the way, speaking about like kind of how you show up is I've, I love the TIA and the TIA has done a ton for me in my, um, in my career. Cause like you go there and it's, it's definitely co-opetition, right? Like everybody, like it's a very open arms space and the people who aren't, don't have that ethos, have that like arms length, keep everybody at arms length. There are those people and some of them have been very successful, but in general, right? Like all of us are really, I may not tell you who my shipper, the shippers I'm working with are. I may not tell you what carriers I'm using on which lane. I may not tell you what the rates I'm charging are. You know, I'm not going to tell you those things, but everything else I'm an open book about. And I've always really appreciated that about this industry is that folks, when I meet them and when I have met them, um, they're always willing to, they're willing to share a lot of their failures. And I, I wonder, I do wonder from time to time where that breaks down because then, you know, a lot of these businesses also hold themselves back by admitting their fail, like admitting that, Hey, we've made this mistake or that mistake. Um, but not necessarily being willing to, to do anything about it or to change maybe like to say, like, I need to try something or to, you know, it's one thing to say, I need to try something different. It's another thing to try something different. Right. Like, and, uh, I always, I've always wondered that Jim, like, I'd love your take on that, on that observation. Cause I agree with you. Like we do show up for, as our extended self, like if, and, and, and and most of, a lot of folks in this industry do. I'm curious where they think that breaks down and people just being like, ah, but I, what I'm doing is, I know it's not working, but what I'm doing is fine. My customers are still paying me. I still get for eight, blah, blah, blah. 
Yeah, I, I, I'll go into that a little bit further. What I w really want, because this is a great opportunity to just transverse into this next year, just reflecting it back onto yourself. You know, you shared on your journey and becoming this chief growth officer at Metaphora. And now, how did your career evolve from the, you know, from the freight industry to now into the tech industry and all that with a law degree? You got a beautiful story right there, my friend. You know, you, you play the cards you're dealt. It, that's the story. And then you make the best, you know, you kind of like make the best decisions you can along the way. Um, I've been incredibly lucky that like I've made some bad choices and they've just kind of worked out from time to time. But, you know, I went to law school and then I graduated during the Great Recession and nobody would give me the time of day in the legal profession. And so I had to do something like I wasn't going to be I wasn't going to live on the street if I could help it, right? So I had to do something. So I had an opportunity to get into logistics sales and I did it. And then I just, I wouldn't say I made the best of it. I was pretty miserable most of the time, but, you know, but I just, I hustled and I, 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 I tried to take chances. I took chances. Some of them worked out. Some of them didn't. I always learned when they didn't work out, right? You win or you, it's, you know, the, the phrase like you win or you learn, like you never lose, you win or you learn. That's true of me. But I also was always, you know, because I, I saw this industry as very broken fundamentally. So this is the transition to technology. I always, I always saw this business as very fundamentally broken and I always thought it could be better. You know, I think the things that bothered me about being a freight broker and, and, and a transportation provider, um, they were always... You know, at first, at first I looked outside. It's funny. You t it's so funny how some of the things that you said tie back, right? Like pointing the finger at other people. Like I would get upset. I think I would get upset about carriers, this shippers, that, you know, blah, blah, blah. I can't control any of those things. Like what can I control? And I started, you know, I thought and thinking about incentives. Well, why are they acting that way? Why is the carrier doing that? Or why is the shipper doing this? Um, and, uh, and then how can I control that or affect that? And so I think that I always, I always looked at the space as like fundamentally broken and then thought about like, how are better ways to solve those problems? Um, and, and so I, I always looked inside the four walls of my business and thought about training. How can I, I have limited resources. It's also a business of limited resources, right? Most freight brokers operate on operating ratios between 90 and 98%. So they're spending you know, they have two cents of every dollar that they made in revenue available for growth initiatives, right? I mean, if unless you're making a hundred million dollars as a company, you don't have a lot of money to invest in growth. So technology can be a shortcut for those things if done in the right way with the right um with the right uh, strategies behind them. And so I was always just looking for a better way to do these things and being willing to try out. Because what did I have to lose at some point? Like, what did I have to lose, right? At at some level, but I didn't get there overnight, right? I got there by being really stuck for a while, being really frustrated for a while, and then asking myself, like, okay, why did I make those decisions that were wrong? Why did I make what you know what decisions that I make were wrong? And then how could I do those differently? Like, I once ran a I wanted I ran a thirty million dollar run rate freight bro, bro, freight brokerage off of Google Sheets. Like technology doesn't solve every single problem. But Google Sheets was everything that I used or that we used. Um, and it was painful and it was, ex I guess, also QuickBooks. But like it was expensive. It was painful. It was challenging. But like we did it. Um, so it doesn't solve all the problems. But I think for me, it really came down to what, how do I make this easier for people to sleep at night, right? Like so that, so that we don't have some of these problems. Uh, that's my thought. Yeah, I totally get it. And I love how you just really got in there and whatever it takes to make it happen. It's like any of us, any one that's out there right now that's struggling with something, just because whatever you're dealing with is in front of you that you just failed or you feel like you failed, doesn't mean it's over with. We have this humanistic ability to transcend any problem. And what you did there was you use QuickBooks, you use Google Sheets, even though it was a $30 million top line revenue business, you utilize that. You know, I did the same thing in 1991 when I got an understanding of Keypoint, their, their TMS, 
and these green screens. And I, I've been doing uh, Lotus 1, 2, 3 since what, 19, I wanna say 1983 when they first came out. And I've been building macros. I just created all my own macros within the department. And I just ran this whole thing that said, probability is these five carriers, call these five carriers, they'll book it. And I built this whole database outside of that using KPI queues, right, to really get the data and then utilized it in 1991 to 1993. And then I started moving 67 loads a day. But it didn't start with the technology. Like, I think what's important about what you just described that I want to highlight for anybody who's listening is it didn't start with the technology. It started with the business problem you were trying to solve. Like, I, you're sitting there saying like, okay, I need to move more freight with less effort. I want, like, one of the first real for me kind of like moments where I had like a, a real shift in how I thought about technology and and data and how it can impact um, and how it can impact my decision making was it was probably twenty we had a rate recession in twenty fourteen I think right and maybe it's twenty fifteen somewhere around twenty fourteen twenty fifteen and uh, and I thought my carrier reps at the time were just like I was like I think that the, I don't I don't think that they're negotiating well with carriers. And so before I tried to solve this problem with technology, before I like went and yelled at a bunch of people, I'm like, well, what, what's the data tell me? And, and that's not a very, how, where would that show up in the data? Right. Like I, you know, and so, you know, if I, if I understand how these parties act and interact and what their incentives are, right. Driver carriers incentive is to get as much money as possible. Carrier reps incentive is to get commission, whatever you, it's also to book the freight. It's not necessarily to maximize profit and minimize loss. If if you know if you're thinking purely commission, blah blah blah. So it's like, all right, well, let me look at the data and the data. What, what like what data do I need to find that out? Well, I need to know what the starting max bid was, and I need to know what the ending price was, and from there, I know how these parties interact with each other. So I expect that I'm going to see a lot of clustering around this number, and some that look like this, and some that look like that. And sure enough, that's what the data told me. 76% of our load, you know, if it, you've got a carrier on the phone and they and you offer them a rate that they're okay with, what are they going to do? They're going to ask for $15 more, right? Because worst thing that says is no, and they say, I take the load anyway. 76% of my freight was booked at max buy or plus $50. 14% was booked more than $50. And so I went to my carrier reps and I, tra- and then I didn't, again, I didn't put, apply technology to the solution yet. I went to them and I gave them training. All of these are business strategies first. And all I gave them training. Hey guys, here's what's happening. Here's what I see is happening. Here, let me get do some training on negotiation. By the way, let, then let me incentivize you to do the things that I want to do. So I put up a spiff up. Anyway, long story, slightly less long. Immediately, immediately, we started booking freight under max buy and we started making more money. We made, I think, $20,000 more a week in gross profit just from that change. And... You know, and that that was a meaningful outcome. And then it was also a meaningful outcome for my team members. And so I think that, you know, what you described that's important, Jim, is like it starts with it has to start with what are the what am I trying to solve in my business? What do I need to make my business successful? How am I empowering my people? I get a I certainly get a rap online of like being this technology guy. It all starts with empowering people. I want people to be successful. I just want them to do things that people need to do. Let's let technology, when something's working, let's let technology handle the part of it that's working. And then when it's not working, let's have people do the part that people need to do to make it work. And that's that's how, I, and I think you did, what you described very much fits in that. Well, thanks. And, and I love how you just took one of the biggest technological roadblocks that someone would see and be able to transform the business around it. And that's exactly what you did. And there, you now you're able to make another twenty thousand dollars per week in a business that's really going to help, you know, in incentives and taking care of customer service if it is being on time more often, deliveries better, less rolled loads. And as you go through this whole process, it just takes one person. And all the listeners out there, it's not just you and I, Ryan. You know, and yes, everybody looks at you as this tech. Technological guru, if you will, and they look to you, but we all have that. We don't have to have a C plus or a COBOL programming background to understand 
what a syntax error is, right, or a go-to, right, we all can do that, right? It does help having to the basics of knowing how to program in basic, but us being human beings is basic language. And what you're seeing is you're seeing a problem and then you're creating a solution for it. Every single employee that's out there employed, it doesn't matter if it's transportation or not. We all have a voice. We all have a brain. And we all have this opportunity to stand up. And like we were talking earlier, is being vulnerable enough to say, question, isn't there a better way? And you know, and a lot of it also starts with like, what are you actually trying to accomplish? And and to your point about mindset, like one of the things I've always said to my to 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 team members is like, you know, my favorite thing about brokerage is that the cheapest carrier is actually typically the best carrier if you're doing it the right way, right? Like there are irregular route over the road carriers, I like load board carriers, and they have a business to run, and their business is they they need to they need to make money and and they want to make as much money as possible but backhaul carriers right they have a business to run and they need to make as much money as possible but your you know the fit for your business is about creating creating a a a, a match that's more powerful than the rate per mile that you're paying them and if you really understand again if you understand like hey what am i here to accomplish am i just here to close am i here to clear the load board Yes. Okay. But then what's the knock on effect of that thing? Okay. I made this shot. I'm also thinking about how could I have done that better? And so, all right, I made the shot. I booked the load. If I book it with a carrier that is, you know, they're inexpensive and they're going to provide the best service, that just multiplies my power as an individual to get ahead. It, 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 and, and am I trying to get ahead today or am I trying to get ahead long term in my career? And really getting specific on that stuff and having the mindset and the the ability to to parse why am I taking the actions that I'm taking? Why am I doing this job the way that I'm doing it? I think for me, it came from I was so miserable to be a freight broker because it felt like failure from day one. Like it did, right? I mean, I I had a law degree and I'm sitting here with a bunch of 23-year-old kids who came straight out of school and I'm three years older than they are, right? And and I've got this law degree and I passed the bar and whatever. And I have the same job as them making the same money, whatever. And it came from like, okay, well, because I'm so unhappy, I can, I'm thinking about all of the reasons in which this is broken. And I really want to understand why am I doing this? And I was always thinking about why am I doing this? And there's other more healthy ways to come to that point or that realization. But that ties back to the, why am I taking these actions? What am I doing? Why am I doing it? And it doesn't have to be technology grounded at all. Great. When it's working, think about how you can apply technology to it, right? To your, but, but it starts with, why am I doing this? What am I trying to accomplish at enough detail to really understand the root problem to be able to affect it for yourself? And that might be finding customers that you know, working with customers who truly value the service that you provide as an intermediary. Like if you're just hustling freight or chasing freight, and it's easy for us to say, because we're much further along in our careers and we've had, you know, the opportunity to make money as, and, 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 and we are making money and, you know, what have you, but, but ultimately like, right. I mean, when you're, when you're sitting there, you need to, if you, what am I building toward and how am I building toward it? And how is what I'm doing right now affect that positively or negatively? What positive success signals am I getting that are actually red herrings? What negative success signals am I having that are actually red herrings, right? You could go get a pallet shipper like that, you know, but like that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that you're, that you're a, that is a good customer. It's a terrible customer, but like, great. I signed a credit app. I have a customer, but that's not helping you. You point out a really good point. And that's when we're looking at what is that, what is that tree that we're looking at? Do we see the tree? Because the tree has roots those root problems are down below the surface in the soil. Are we just not even paying attention to the tree? Are we just walking by and, and we know there's a problem there and we just don't care? Are we not listening? Are we not even aware that there's a problem, yet alone the root cause? Some people, and it sounds like you and I are congenial in this, that we're not only seeing the trees that that are there. We're looking for the root cause. Then we're getting in there, identifying it, building a structure to support it for the future. That leads us all the way into like a leadership scenario where I exercise leadership effectively 
as if it was my natural self-expression. And that's what I'm hearing from you too in this call here is what are your leadership principles that really guide you in your everyday life, Ryan? Uh, that's a great question. I think that it starts with knowing, or for me, it definitely starts with, with knowing myself and understanding my own limitations. I often say, do things that other people aren't willing to do, right? And so like zig when, you, zig when other people are zagging, you know, you see on LinkedIn a lot, like cold calling is dead. And to me, that's like, great start cold calling again, then, you know, like do the thing that people aren't willing to do. Um, and sometimes that means also like investing in yourself. Like a lot of people aren't willing to take care of themselves in the way that, that, that you need to, to continue to maintain. And I'm, I'm guilty of that myself often. Um, but for me, the leadership principles really understand with, start with understanding myself and how I show up and, and so that like, I understand how I'm showing up in ways that, are not helpful to my team members. Like, you know, I'm a very passionate, emotional person and that's good. That drives me often, but it also, it can get in the way. It can get in the way in the ways in which I react and in the way in ways in which I show up and, and, and whether I'm being helpful or not. And so it's, it definitely starts with looking inside and it's funny, you're right. You talked about pointing fingers. It's funny that it's coming back to that. Like, and that was totally unintentional. But it does, it starts there. It starts with looking at myself and understanding myself and how I show up for my teamers. It's also okay to say that um, that I'm not going to be a totally different person tomorrow or like ever. And there are certainly like core values and core things that I need from team members coming back to me for me to be successful. And I think, but it, it understands, you know, and so I can know how to ask for that or I, I am learning, let me rephrase that, I am learning how to ask for those things and how to, and how to suss out whether I'm getting those things or not and how to solve some of the limitations that I have because I'm only one person and I can't do everything and I won't do everything and I don't want to do everything. Um, and I think that's another thing that we see in this industry a lot. People seeming to think that they have to solve all the world's problems and they don't. What you need to do is build the most successful people and the most successful companies, the folks that have built the most successful companies in this industry, they weren't one person. They may, you know, they may be known for one person. Jim Becker is known for Becker Logistics. You know, Jeff Silver is known for Coyote. Kevin Nolan's known for Nolan Transportation Group. But when you know those people, you know that they what they were really great at was building great teams around themselves that could do the things that they were not great at. Kevin Nolan's awesome. I love Kevin Nolan. He had a great team around him that could do some of the things that he wasn't great at, like coaching people on a day-to-day -day basis, et cetera. So I think that it starts with knowing yourself, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're so right about knowing yourself. There's um, a really in-depth reflection that I did with myself, just really getting to know who this guy is. We talked about something, you know, meeting each other. The first time we met was like 10 years ago. Um, and I'm not the same guy as I was back then. I'm completely different. And so are you. Thank God I'm different. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Right. And so every single day I'm identifying that, wow, this is a different person immediately from getting up at five o'clock in the morning after getting eight hours of sleep so that my body's fully recharged like a Tesla would be right. I wouldn't leave my house for a 500 mile journey on 20% battery on my Tesla. My body needs to be charged up 100%. I could probably get by with 90, maybe even 80, but eight hours of sleep is my full charge. Then I go work out for an hour and I stretch for a half hour. Then I meditate for a half hour, right? That's getting me ready for the day out in front of me so that I can be out there and serve. You know, as I do that, it just makes me available to serve out there in the world, wherever it is. If it's a business owner calling me and saying, hey, Jim, I need some help. If it's one of my employees or one of my managers or executives saying, hey, what do we do here? My question to you is, what's your personal philosophy on really innovating the logistics industry in business in general, especially through, you know, your current company? My philosophy is do things that other people aren't willing to do or won't do or can't do, but start by solving the problems that you control. 
it's so funny how much we're just talking about like looking inside ourselves or whatever, looking inside the four walls of your business. You can influence how other people do things, right? Obviously, but you can't force them to do things. And to the extent that you can force them to do things, they they still have their own incentives, et cetera. And they're, and they're looking for ways to give you what you need or what you're making them do, but nothing more. And, and, and so like it always, for me, it's always started with inside the four walls of our business. So, you know, my last company, Freight AI, who we were talking about a minute ago, right? Um, we, and it's a lot easier to talk about this now because people know what natural language processing is and generative AI, but our approach was, was, was applying natural language processing and generative AI to problems inside of freight brokerage because channel preference, meaning how you engage phone, email, text, what have you is a very real thing. And I can drive, I can try and drive you toward an app on your phone, but you may or may not want to do that. And even to the extent that you do, when that falls down, I still need to meet you in your channel that you want to engage in. Because that's because I can solve some of the four walls change management stuff inside my business, but I can't make, it's harder for me to make you do something. And so I've always really taken that approach or that philosophy and then do things whole ass, not half ass. So like, I'm going to invest in training. Like I, I training is a big part of what I talk about or think about. And so like if I'm going to do something, I'm going to invest in teaching people how to do it. I and I, and I have and I do. And so and there's an ed, like that you have to slow down, you have to be willing to invest in that, and then you have to be willing to say this is working or not working. Like to your commentary around like what you need to do to show up with 100% full battery, I'm sure there's going to be people who listen to this and say well, that's easy for Jim and Ryan to say because they don't have a sales manager beating down their door to make 100 cold calls today. And that's true. I don't have that. Thank God I don't have that. But I know that that's not something that I could work with even if I did. And so I'm not saying that you can change the way your sales manager works, but you control your own outcomes and you control your own agency, right? And so you can say, I know what it takes for me to be successful. This is not it. I need to go do something else or find something else. And so my approach toward technology is the same as my approach toward, um, you know, personal development and growth, which is control what you can control, focus on deploying solutions that you can control, and then understand what, and then, and then be a good steward of, uh, of your place. And so invest in outcomes for your customers, invest in outcomes for your capacity providers, uh, that actually solve their problems. Not that shift your burdens to them, but that solve problems for them in ways that make sense for their business and their incentivization. Actually try and learn who they are and what they need and what they want. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to business leaders, both inside my companies and outside of my company, that that I had to say, well, that's a you problem. Like the customer doesn't care about that. That's a you problem. Yes. If they did that, that would be better for you, but there's a reason they're not doing it. It'd be better for all of us if every shipper and receiver was first come, first serve. There's a reason that they don't do that. Why? What other problems are they solving with appointments? And then how do you work with them to develop or deploy solutions, technical and non-technical, that help them affect their outcomes and help you affect your outcomes. That's a little bit of how I think about it. Yeah, I love that. I love how you put all that together. And that's just really great advice for anyone really aspiring. I mean, I think so. I'm glad you think so too, Jim. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. I'm, I'm sure our listeners think so too. It's great advice um, to aspire entrepreneurs looking to actually either to grow or expand or even do what they're doing better or even to enter this space that we're currently in. You know, this is where, you know, speaking with, you know, I would say like we're both consultants in this in this industry. As we're consulting, a lot of people have everything that you and I have. We're all equal. We're all given the same the same body. We're we're given bones, we're given blood, we're given the the ability to breathe in this kingdom and then to exhale it. And as we do that, we all have it. What's stopping us? What's our roadblocks from moving forward? And I'd love to really put people into touch with Metaphora. And what, how do they get a hold of you? And how do they get to you know, really see what your services are and how they could actually utilize your services? Sure. Uh, well, the best way to reach me is definitely on LinkedIn. 
Brian B. Schreiber. Um, our website, uh, Metaphora, spelled with an F, M-E-T-A-F-O-R-A dot net. It's actually Greek for transportation. Uh, so if you happen to speak Greek, feel free to at me and tell me that that's not, but that's, that's what we, that's what we think. Um, uh, metaphora.net, uh, is a good place to, to learn a little bit more about, about what we do and which is, which is primarily supporting this industry through technology consulting. So we help people figure out what to do with their technology and then we help them implement those strategies. And that's capacity providers, it's shippers, it's technology companies, it's private equity group. And so I, I have the best job in the world. It's a lot of fun. So, um, uh, that's how you find us. Well, listen, I want to thank you so much, Ryan, for really joining us today. And I hope the listeners got really a whole bunch of information that will just take them to the next level, whatever the level that is that they choose. Thanks again, Ryan. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on, man. Thank you very much. And that wraps up today's episode of Launching Logistics. I want to give big thanks to Ryan Schreiber for joining us and sharing such thoughtful insights into his journey from the logistics industry to the tech space. What I really loved about today's conversation was Ryan's emphasis on mindset, how we as leaders and business owners need to be adaptable and constantly open to learning. As Ryan pointed out, the willingness to admit when we really don't know something and the ability to reflect on the mistakes are key drivers for personal and business growth. One of the highlights for me was Ryan's take on solving the problems that are within your control. He reminded us that we can't always change the external factors in our industry, whether it's the market conditions or the behavior of shippers, not to mention the carriers. But we can always take control of how we react and adapt internally. His approach to leveraging technology as a tool for empowerment rather than just a band-aid for inefficiencies is a powerful takeaway. It's not just about implementing the latest tech, it's about knowing what problems you need to solve first and then finding the right solutions to address them. Another key point Ryan raised was about the importance of building trust, not just with your clients, but with your own team. He talked about being vulnerable and honest when you don't have all the answers and how that can lead to stronger relationships and better business outcomes in the long run. It's a reminder that being a great leader isn't about having all the answers. It's about being willing to admit when you don't and working collaboratively to find the solutions. As we look ahead in the logistics and supply chain space, the idea of continuous learning and adaptability that Ryan highlighted is going to be more critical than ever. Whether you're leading a team of people, growing a business, or simply trying to navigate these fast-changing times, Ryan's insight offers a roadmap for how to keep pushing forward. Thanks again, Ryan, for being part of today's episode. And of course, a huge thank you to all of you tuning in today. If you found this conversation valuable, please share it with your network, leave a review and subscribe so you don't miss out on future episodes. We're committed to bringing you the best insight from top industry leaders, and we wouldn't have done this without your support. Until next time, keep driving innovation, stay open to change, and continue building towards your success. This is Jim Becker, and I'll catch you on the next episode of Launching Logistics. Take care, everyone.